good afternoon, Vermont. I call this meeting of the advisory. This meeting is being recorded and or transcribed. Well, to order, I'm Tom Alasco. I'll now take roll for our subcommittee members, um, beginning with uh, Mark Gorman. Present. Dan Smith. Here. Jen Flanagan. Yes. Siobhan Patel. I think he's in the room. Mm -hmm. um, Stephanie. Yep. Stephanie Smith. Here. You're able to meet over there. <laughs> Chris Wall. Present. And um, from the cannabis board, Sharon Pepper. I'll, I'll just well. Yeah, I'll review who's in the room here, uh, if yes. you don't mind. So it's uh, James Pepper, chair. Kyle Harris, member of the Cannabis Control Board. Julie Holbert, member. We have Bryn Hare, our executive director. Nellie Marvel. And then we have three members of the public. Perfect. So thank you everyone for your attendance. Uh, greetings to you all. Thank you for making the effort and having the interest to attend this subcommittee meeting. Since this is our first subcommittee meeting, uh, I, I wanted to do brief, and I wanted to emphasize brief because we have much to do and discuss. Intros for the members on the subcommittee before moving on with our agenda. I'll be speaking very quickly just because of time constraints. Again, I'm Tom Alaska. I'm general counsel for the National Association of Cannabis Businesses, or the NCB, the National Trade Organization that specializes in creating standards and best practices for the cannabis industry. The goal is to legitimize and elevate the growth of this growing cannabis marketplace. And part of our function at the, at the NACB is to consult with state legislators and regulators as we're doing in this engagement. My background now is a 20 plus year attorney. Uh, specializing in business commercial litigation, I've been in the cannabis space for seven or eight years, starting with uh, partnership disputes in cannabis that grew to compliance, uh, employment, real estate issues, any issues that a good startup has. I uh, served on panels for the Arizona State Bar where I'm based, um, and then that led to panels throughout the country on issues like 288 licensing, social equity. So my privilege to help coordinate these various subcommittee meetings and create good policy for the state of Vermont. So before getting into the introductions uh, for very knowledgeable and accomplished advisory committee members, I wanted to introduce uh, Mark Gorman and then go on to Dan Smith and Jen Flanagan who will be leading this subcommittee. Mark? Thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm, uh, as I said, Mark Gorman. I'm uh, at the uh, NACB for about a year and a half prior to that for, uh, and I'm, uh, the uh, executive vice president and chief government uh, uh, person for NACB. Before that, I've spent uh, about 20 years in another highly regulated industry, the uh, distilled spirits industry, and uh, surprisingly, spent uh, about six or seven of the last years uh, tracking cannabis and, and uh, you know the market, what was going on in the market, and with the legalization and so forth. So, um, I've been. Uh, working on this now for close to 10 years and and, uh, and got all that background with uh, distilled spirits as well which I think will come in handy sometimes uh, with our discussions. Thanks Mark and I'm sorry I was remiss uh, part of the roll call Jeff Gallegos for the NHB is here as well. Jeff you want to give a brief instruction? Hello everybody my name is Jeff Gallegos. I'm a research attorney for NACP. I live in Los Angeles, California. My background is as a, as a musician, and I've been around cannabis for a long time, so I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, another lawyer. Dan Smith. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Smith. Uh, I am vice president at BS Strategies, which is a cannabis policy and public affairs uh, consulting firm. Um, we uh partnering with our uh, sister organization, uh, the Dante Cedarberg, the law firm, uh, are one of the um, consultants for, for the state of Vermont right here. And, we, and while NACB is kind of running the um, uh, the, the uh, advisory committee subgroups, they brought us on uh, to help with this one. So uh, you'll be seeing a lot of our faces over the next, next few weeks. So uh, my background is I do a lot of state level uh, policy around the country for various clients, um, all cannabis related. Before I've been with BS Strategies for uh, approaching three years now. Before that, I was in the 
uh, Massachusetts. I worked for the, uh, a senator in the Massachusetts legislature, uh, where I was the lead staffer for the adult use bill that, that moved through um, there and was signed into law in, in 2017. So um, there's a couple more folks from my team on the call, uh, one of which who I was also in the legislature with back at that time. So I'll let them introduce themselves, uh, starting with uh, Jen Flanagan. Good afternoon, my name is Jen Flanagan. I am the Director of Regulatory Policy at the Sente Cedarburg, um, the law firm side of um, the Sente Cedarburg. Uh, prior to this, I was a commissioner on the Cannabis Control Commission. I was appointed in 2017 by Governor Baker to be the public health appointee on the commission. Um, immediately before that, I served as a state senator for nine years in the Massachusetts State Senate, uh, focusing on public health, mental health, substance use disorder, um, and the like. And immediately before that, I served for four years in the House of Representatives. So I just ended my 25-year career in state government, um, really seeing both sides of legalized cannabis, uh, passing the law and creating the law, but then implementing it through the regulatory process. So I'm happy to be here with my colleague. Thank you, Jen. And then um, Dan, Andrew, uh, let me yeah, Andrew. Andrew. Um, Andrew's, uh, you'll be hearing a lot from Andrew today. I'll let him introduce himself now, but um, uh, yeah, Andrew, take it away. Thanks, Dan, and thanks, Tom. Um, so my name is Andrew Livingston. I'm the Director of Economic and Research at uh, Pacetti Cedarburg, the law firm, and I'm also a partner at CM Strategies. Um, my background is in economic analysis and uh, detailed regulatory policy analysis, where over the last eight plus years, I've been um, kind of leading some of the space in economic and market analysis for cannabis businesses across the country and across the world. Um, and I put together the, uh, what you guys will see, quite detailed market analysis for Vermont. Thank you, Andrew. And now to get into um, introductions for our advisory subcommittee members uh, on this subcommittee. Siobhan Patel, do you want to say hello and give a brief introduction? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, Steve Angotel. I've spent uh, the last decade in Vermont entrepreneurial and business community uh, and across regulatory policy in a number of industries. But like Mark, I spent 10 years in alcohol policy, uh, specifically Vermont alcohol policy. So, you know, I, I've been on the Vermont side for a long time, and I agree with Mark that there should be a lot of parallels in industries. Thank you, Steve. And Stephanie Smith? Yep, um, Stephanie Smith with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. I managed to have program for the agency and have experience in land use planning and environmental permitting. And, and definitely not Lee. Chris Walsh, you want to say hello in an intro? Yes, hi, Chris Walsh here. Uh, similar to Mark and Savon, I have a 19 year, year experience with one regulatory market in Vermont alcohol. I moved up here from Manhattan in 2003, purchased Nectars, um, went from Nectars to co-creating a grocery store on Pine Street. I am co-founder of a Vermont organic uh, CBD brand called Upstate Elevator Supply. I am an escapee from one of the MSOs. I ran the Iantis asset in Brandon, Vermont for two years as president. Um, I spent a year in Jamaica growing cannabis and hemp in conjunction with the University of West Indies Medical School doing cannabinoid and terpene research. My day job right now is agricultural technology and I'm also heading up operations for Ben Cohen's new social equity cannabis brand called Ben's Best. Great, thank you Chris. And uh, Chairman Pepper, I understand we have two or three other members uh, of the public in the room with you. Um, I wanted to make sure that everyone knows that written public comments can be submitted electronically via the web form on the CCB website and have been since two, May 2021. And I wanted to ensure everyone that your comments have been received, reviewed, and considered uh, by each and every subcommittee member, and we appreciate your input. There will be time for public comments and questions toward the end of the hour, uh, as there will be with it each subcommittee meeting that we have going forward. And in addition, the Cannabis Control Board will be hosting dedicated meetings for public comments, uh, both at a Friday board meeting via the public uh, link or at the CCB's public comment evenings that will also be posted on the website. So your voice will be heard and considered 
and it's an important part of the process, but we do have pressing deadlines, particularly with this subcommittee, um, and they're upon us. It's critical we have constructive communication between the board members to meet those deadlines, so I don't want the hour to be dominated by public comments. Again, you will have an opportunity at the end of each meeting, and there are those other avenues to address uh, and be heard. So, um, moving forward, Dan, uh, you know, we're all anxious to see um, and hear the market analysis. A lot of the work that's going to be done and accomplished within this subcommittee uh, with these quick deadlines coming up, um, a lot of the other subcommittees are kind of relying on that as well. So, I will let you uh, take control. Sounds good, thanks Tom. Yeah, and just, uh, I'll just give a kind of a quick overview of, uh, of what we were thinking here and kind of our plan, because I think it will be a little bit different from um, some of the other uh, subcommittees. So uh, as Tom mentioned, there's uh, very quick deadlines for many of these subcommittees, but in particular, the first deadline coming up kind of overall uh, for the Cannabis Control Board is that by the end of this month, for, for October 1, they're supposed to submit a report to the legislature on um, license fees. So uh, obviously to know what we should recommend for license fees, we need to know what type of licenses they're going to be and kind of size the market. So a lot of that flows um, into this subcommittee. And so in a very short amount of time, um, we were going to try to put together some recommendations uh, to the board so that the board can make a recommendation to the legislature. Um, so, unlike probably some of the other subcommittee meetings, today's meeting will probably be uh, less uh, discussion back and forth and more uh, presentation from um, Andrew. I think you all received his, uh, the, uh, the supply and demand model that he put together um, that I think we're going to try to use to inform some of these um, decisions. I'm seeing some head nods. Did, did that not go out to everyone? Uh, Vaughn, you did not get it. Chris, did you get it? Yeah. Okay. Um, Vaughn, give me one sec, or uh, give me one second. I'll I'll send it over to you uh, uh, right now um, to make sure you get it. But so um, you will see momentarily that it's a pretty uh, big and complex model. So uh, Andrew's going to just kind of walk through some of the assumptions that were made in it, uh, and you can kind of see what what it looks like we anticipate the Vermont market market could look like. Um, so uh, that's going to eat up a bulk of today's uh, meeting. Uh, I believe the next meeting is scheduled for Monday, um, which we will kind of have more open discussion on questions about uh, that you have from, from that, thoughts about how you want to see the market uh, look, uh, things along those lines. Um, all of this is building up and then we'll have twice a week meetings. We'll have a meeting next Monday and next Thursday, a meeting the following Monday, um, kind of all building up towards uh, trying to make some recommendations on fees. Um, so we probably need to have those by uh, the meeting on August, uh, I mean, September 23rd. Um, so that only gives us, uh, you know, about two weeks to, to get, to try to get some estimates on, on what we want. So it's going to be a lot of work um, pretty quickly because we'd like to try to stay on Stay on track for that. So um, we'll send out agendas for these upcoming meetings, but just wanted to highlight that uh, today's meeting will be kind of this presentation of the model. Um, Monday's meeting will be more uh, discussion about thoughts and, and initial thoughts, but we're very quickly going to have to turn into covering different license types and tiers, which I think uh, Thursday the 16th might be a good day for. Um, we also need to address some local fees. Um, which we can start talking about on the 16th and, and finish up on the on the 20th um, and then by the 23rd I think our goal would be to have some written recommendations pulled from your thoughts and, and opinions pulled from what we think is supported by the model um, and that we can discuss and, and hopefully get them approved and sent up to the board so um, during this whole process we'll continue to try to send you some information I think we're planning on sending you kind of a survey of fees from other states so we can see where Vermont would compare to, to other states um, and, and kind of some analysis of like, here's how many uh, licenses there are in other states and how that would compare to Vermont's population, things along those lines. But uh, again, next Monday, if there's anything that you think would be helpful for us to, to try to share with you, let us know and we'll, we'll try to provide it. Because I think we're, we're trying to work 
closely together here to hit a very tight deadline. Um, so it, it's going to be a, a lot of uh, a lot of moving parts in the next couple of weeks. So um, that's kind of the, the overall goal uh, and timeline. I know that wasn't particularly um, like succinct and, and leveled out with days because a lot of it's going to flow depending on how our discussions go next Monday and Thursday. But I uh, just wanted to give you a heads up of, of how we envision this. Um, once we get through that October 1 report deadline, there's probably less, uh, um, you know, less time. It'd still be very quick timeline, but less time consuming. So we can probably start focusing on some of the more, uh, taking a little bit more time with some of these questions, but, but trying to get those recommendations done as quickly as possible. So that's all I have. Um, I uh, will uh, send out that, um, that model now, but I think I'll turn it over to Andrew to, to start his presentation. So uh, sorry, Bob. You'll see the presentation before you get it, but you'll have that model in uh, in a matter of minutes. So, um, Andrew, do you want to do you want to take it away? Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. And I'm going to do a screen share. It's going to be easiest for everyone to see what I'm doing um, and where I'm at with the model. Um, as you will see, there's many tabs. Easy to get lost, although there are as an adjustable index um, that should help guide you through it. So. You just share screen, and then I'm going to ask for confirmation that someone can actually see this on yep. uh, the team on Teams. You guys seeing this? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, this is a detailed supply and demand model. So first and most importantly, um, this being a model, it incorporates uh, data from the state, uh, data from you know other states, and then many many different assumptions. Uh, as it pertains to cultivation capacity, um, you know, yield output uh, per pay, per consumer demand, um, all sorts of different assumptions, and all of these assumptions work together to provide a projection for what we think the Vermont uh, market will look like. The model is hyper adjustable, so any changes to these assumptions will change the output. Um, currently have in there some, some of what we look at as uh, you know, time and place assumptions for a variety of different factors, um, but all of these things are subject to change, particularly as it pertains to um, you know, when we look at individual um, town markets uh, and ascertaining some of those. With, with in there right now, and, I'll and I can show you guys that in a bit, uh, some of those assumptions uh, would need to be expanded upon. So this model includes um, about 20 or so different tabs um, with a primary market analysis model tab here uh, is this kind of uh, pink uh, orange color. So each of these, uh, this is an adjustable index, that lets you know what's in each of these different sections. And you can click on any one of these and be navigated directly to the page. So if you ever get lost, you can't find your way back, uh, on the upper left hand corner is a little index button. You click that, automatically brings you back to the index and you can find where you need, where you need to be. Um, so first let me uh, get to the primary market analysis model tab. And I'll actually talk about what these what's in this from, um, from the index. So this is our, our primary market analysis model. Uh, you know, this brings us uh, directly to this big a uh, big model which, which contains the vast majority of our assumptions, some things where attention is needed. Uh, I think some of these things in yellow, additional tweaks may occur uh, as we go over this uh, further. Uh, but essentially what this model does is it distills uh, demand and supply. So in um, uh, not just Vermont, but, but any uh, adult use cannabis market, uh, your demand is going to be composed of both medical demand and adult use. So when we're looking at the total model, we look at the existing medical patients, how much they are uh, purchasing, um, and how that affects things. So we've got data here on medical cannabis patients, how much they purchase, the category breakdown, and a lot of this comes from, these, uh, from data I obtained from the existing medical cannabis uh, dispensaries uh, and operators in the state of Vermont. Um, Furthermore, we've got you know, projections and things like that based on existing patient data changes since 2018 and trends there. Um, if you're ever wondering on where most of this data comes from, you can find a lot of that in other data tabs. 
uh, a Vermont medical cannabis patient registration. You can see all of the data that underlies it as well as where those projections come from and how they're derived. Let's go back for a second. Um, then we have the Vermont adult use market. Um, within the adult use market, there's about um, four different components of demand. Uh, the first being Vermont resident cannabis consumers. The second being uh, your first degree of border consumers. And those are going to be people that are kind of really directly along the border. Um, and then you have your second degree of border consumers, those which are, you know, usually typically further than half an hour, but less than an hour and a half, about, an, you know, no more than an hour and a half um, from, uh, from the state. Further than that, we have tourist consumers. So these are individuals who are coming to Vermont for tourism, uh, but happen to be cannabis consumers and are likely to purchase cannabis uh, when they are in the state. Um, on the tourist side of things, there's an entire series of, of, of a tourism model that back ends into this, as well as a number of complex data uh, points and assumptions, which give us, uh, give us that information about um, what cannabis consuming tourists may look like. Uh, we have you know, changes in retail prices, the amount that we're estimating that tourists purchase per day, and how this all follows through. Um, this market, the way that this analysis works is we look at all of these different consumers. And then from there, we look at what percentage are likely to purchase from the state of Vermont. So all of this gets turned into Vermont cannabis equivalents because we have data from the National Survey on Drug Use of Health based on intra past month cannabis use frequency. So that's, for instance, how many uh, consumers are FDA consumers or every other day consumers or only a handful of days in the month consumers. And that, when uh, projected onto a price per ounce, gives us an estimate of total monthly expenditures. We then take these monthly expenditures, put that through an analysis of, of what percentage of the market is being spent on different sort of categories, and we get total expenditures. And then when we combine that uh, with initial demand per month, we get initial unit prices and total demand in volume as well. So we have these numbers, and, and we're looking at, okay, what percentage of demand from uh, resident consumers or border consumers or tourists are going to be captured by the regulated market? And this will change over time as the market develops. A lot of these assumptions come from uh, data from Massachusetts as well as Colorado, Oregon, and some others, where, uh, Washington, where we actually have some initial research that looked at what proportion of the market is, um, is purchasing uh, from regulated storefronts. Um, when we're dealing with border consumers, there's actually two different levels here. Because we first need to take off, obviously, you know, consumers in Massachusetts aren't likely to, to travel to Vermont for the sole purpose of buying cannabis, as they have cannabis access in their own backyard, similar to those in Maine, in which it's uh, faster to drive to Portland than it would be to drive to Vermont to buy cannabis. Um, within that, in the border consumers, we have what percentage of border consumers would even consider purchasing. And then from that, we have market capture amongst those consumers who would purchase. Now, there's another level of granularity this, which gets into because uh, we're also dealing with seasonal um, changes over time, right? On the tourism side of things, we have some data that looks at um, how tourism expenditures by month uh, uh, have, have essentially changed over time. Um, based upon non-Vermont uh, restaurant transactions in the state itself. So we're looking at that, we can incorporate in, okay, what percentage of non-Vermont days are spent on each month, uh, spent on each month, and as you can see, there's, you know, because Vermont has such a high uh, tourism draw from its mountains for the ski season, we have a higher amount in January and February, falling into the spring, and then rising during the summer when hiking is great, falling a little bit in September, and then peaking again in October, when uh, the fall colors are, are brilliant in, in Vermont, falling again into November, and then rising as the ski season picks up in December, and then fall, following for January again. So this comes into place uh, as we are looking at some of the tourism numbers. But what's fascinating is that uh, cannabis uh, also is seasonal dynamics that occur beyond just those normal tourism. Uh, as we tend to see higher purchases during the summer and in all sorts of different states. So I have an adjustment here that we can overlay uh, or not seasonal tourism. And I'll show you for a second what this looks like. So on the graph side, 
we can look here at composition of Vermont medical and adult use cannabis consumers and how that changes over time. And if you can see here, there's kind of current normalized trends about uh, how that occurs um, and, and when those peak. Um, and this data is taken predominantly um, from other states. So, you know, there's a, a few different states if we're looking at established uh, trends in Washington, Oregon, and Colorado uh, for those states that have had many years of cannabis sales. And we can look at over time with a number of theory, uh, complex uh, equations and analyses to look at year over year what those seasonal trends look like. Obviously, 2020 being the COVID pandemic uh, has, has changed things quite a bit from its normal trends. Um, so for these purposes, we're looking at Colorado, Washington, and Oregon, some of the states with a long enough period of time that we actually have trend analysis. In Nevada, because tourism overtakes so much of normal uh, normal activities, it's not really as analogous to utilize for Vermont. So here we're looking at the seasonal trends, averages uh, above or below averages from uh, these three states over these three years. And we utilize this to be able to apply a seasonal uh, trend overlay onto uh, our analysis. Uh, there's a toggle button, so we can turn this off. And we did that, you can see for instance here, uh, while tourism maintains uh, its data, uh, here on the adult use consumers, we're no longer overlaying those differentials. So I'm going to turn it back on for a second so that we can really appreciate the uh, differences that occur at the month-by-month uh, the -month level uh, when it comes to those seasonal overlays. We then have all of these consumers, and these consumers demand and then uh, those that are captured by the regulated market that come from these assumptions then flow into our total adult use demand and total expenditures based on our assumptions here. So that's just on this first side. Uh, and then this factors in both medical and adult use. Uh, and then we get into cultivation. So on the cultivation side, um, this market includes both an indoor and outdoor slash greenhouse uh, cultivation schedule option. Uh, because this analysis is being looked at from the state level, while they have control over a number of different factors, they don't have control over everything. And so when we are looking into this, you know, we say, okay, how many cultivators are we starting with? Now this number could be higher or lower. Uh, in, it could be unlimited. And, and I think that that's likely uh, what's going to be the fact in Vermont. But for the sake of just this model, I think it's important, it's important for us to put in, okay, what number, if we don't have a limit on licensing, how many cultivators are we actually gonna think uh, are going to come in, register, build out, um, and operate in the state of Vermont? So we can put this number in here. And this all pulls into this sort of model, which is uh, quite complex, uh, but utilizes a number of different factors. So the most important thing here is trying to identify what the square feet of flowering canopy space is, right? We can increase the number of cultivators, and as long as we, increase, we keep flat the number of square feet of flowering canopy, it won't actually change the total output um, in the state of Vermont. It will change some of the frequency of harvest, but essentially your canopy for cultivators goes down as the number of cultivators goes up. Uh, given uh, no changes in square feet of flowering canopy space. So if, for instance, we had 400,000 square feet of canopy, we'd have about 2,000 square feet of flowering canopy per cultivator. Now again, that's flowering uh, canopy space. So that is how much uh, plants in flower under light do you have uh, in your facility. Um, this, is, this is for indoor. Again, we also have an outdoor model as well, which again uses flowering canopy. But that's going to be a little bit different because it's, you know the uh, the growth the, they might be further apart, um, and so there's a number of averages that are pulled in from there. So because uh, the state of Vermont has control over licensing, you know, let's say for instance they start licensing in January of 2022, and again all of this is adjustable. And let's say they they license for 18 months um, uh, on an average of about 11 license, cultivation licenses a month. Uh, over that period of time, and maybe after that period of time, they realize you know we, we had enough people coming in. Maybe you know our licenses is trickling. We don't want to deal with with oversupply issues or things like that. Close licensing. Um, what this model allows us to project is okay. If someone gets their license, like say in uh, June of 2022, they're not the earliest business. They're probably not the latest amongst all the cohort. They get it in June of 2022. Let's say it takes a month. Um, from the start of final licensing to the end of final licensing, what the state does not necessarily know is how long is it going to take them to build out their facility and to actually cultivate cannabis and start putting cannabis plants in the ground. 
So this model uh, for both indoor and outdoor includes a degree of randomization with a, a series of complex random number generators which allow us to continually look at how long it's going to take the different people to build out and utilize these averages in Massachusetts and others in discussions with consultants. Uh, we have a normal range of four to 12 months with a look with a outlier range of two to four months or 12 to 18 months with an average of eight months uh, from the start of final life the, through the date in which plants are on the ground. Uh, then utilizing the data in, from Massachusetts, we have what percentage fall in different outliers, about two thirds in the normal range and one third at the low outlier, uh, sorry, and one sixth at the low outlier and one sixth at the high outlier range. So what this allows us to do then is we look at over time um, when this different licensing will occur. And as you can see here, it's just got color coded things that when you start putting clones in the ground and when you're, when you're harvesting, um, this model, because each of these are going to be small, these looks at these as, as each individual growth facility, assuming that each growth facility uh, turns over every 128 days, i.e. once it's done with its harvest, it puts clones in the ground in that same room. We have a situation in which uh, a cultivation facility has a bedroom and a harvest room and it's, it's rotating on a more frequent basis, uh, which is absolutely fine, um, but for simplicity purposes, this model looks at each of these small growers as kind of utilizing one room for, uh, for both vegetation and harvest. Um, and with, in each of this, because there's a random number generator, um, these numbers change every time you press F9, every time you redo things. So the numbers, when you look at it, uh, may be different every time you open up the document uh, as it pertains to the supply. And that really takes into, uh, into the case that there's a certain degree that we don't under, we don't know exactly when that supply is going to come online, how many of these growers are going to build quickly or slowly, that all of this is factored in. So this exists both for our cultivation side. Then on each of these uh, facilities, we have the, the yield. Uh, this comes from some of the existing medical operators, how much is flour, how much is trim, uh, both in wet weight, uh, if you're doing live resin, uh, as well as dry flour and dry trim. What of that gets allocated for testing, what fail testing, what is possibly able to be remediated and turned to concentrate, uh, and what gets pulled, what of the harvest gets pulled for uh, extraction. This is a similar sort of thing occurs for the greenhouse cultivation, except for the greenhouse, uh, rather than a certain number of months, we have a start date uh, on the low and high end because of obviously if you're growing outdoors, there's a limited uh, harvest season to utilize in the state of Vermont. And so here we have a frequency of cultivation every year, every 365 days, with harvesting that needing the plants in the ground that need to occur during a set period of time. Also, the number of days here differs a little bit given that this would be an outdoor model. Uh, as well as the yield, which flows in, this is similar to uh, what we see for the indoor. Then we have combined. Uh, and then we get into extraction. We look at um, you know, how much uh, extraction capacity do we need in order to meet all of the, the cannabis demand in the state. Um, then flows through. I'm going to skip over some of this uh, for brevity purposes. Then looking at what the extraction yield efficiency is, what percentage, uh, let's say you put a pound of, you know, uh, 453.592 grams, you know, a pound uh, into your extraction machine, how many grams you get out. Uh, so this is our yield efficiency of the oil. And then as well, we have uh, the amount of oil that needs to go for testing and, and the percentage of batches that fail testing. Um, then from the production of all of this oil, we get into the question of uh, when cannabis products are produced, we have lost uh, with transferring this oil into the, into the products themselves. Let's say you know, you're filling your vape pens or you're, uh, you're producing uh, edible products, a flower loss from filling pre-rolls, loss from packaging the product, some, package, some products break, some uh, packaging is uh, not up to par, the labeling is wrong, that will have loss as well, as well as again additional testing on the supply chain for edible products and household products. In order to determine how many products we can produce, we look at the amount of oil that was produced and, and put in estimates for THC extraction potency. So this, you know, let's say you, you put in a pound of cannabis, uh, you get a certain amount of grams of oil. And then the question is, what percentage THC is that oil? Because what we need to target is average size for these different sorts of, uh, of products. Um, and the amount of THC that's in each of these, which then allows us to know how much oil needs to go into them, accounting for loss that occurs when creating the product, loss that occurs packaging up, things like that. Um, 
Uh, from here, we're looking at, okay, in order to get this, uh, this allocation correct, how do we want to allocate all our flour between pre-rolls and, and cannabis flour or bud sales, as well as uh, our oil, which we concentrate in state pens, edible products, and topical products? Um, all of this comes into place because uh, Vermont is likely, given its, uh, its potency restrictions for manufactured cannabis products, likely going to balance some of that with uh, CBD in order to meet the regulatory requirements. We also have in here uh, CBD required for products and how much a uh, CBD isolate might be required given the quantity of products we're producing and the amount of CBD that would be required in them, uh, utilizing some data from hemp benchmarks and others uh, to try to understand how much CBD biomass is required for one kilogram of CBD isolate. This looks at about 50 grams of, uh, of cannabis, uh, of, of hemp biomass at 8% uh, produces about one kilogram of, uh, of CBD oil, and then about two, between two and two and a half uh, kilograms of CBD oil, I use it to create one kilogram of CBD isolate. Um, so this gives us all of our estimates here. Also, the model is, uh, we've got a number of different tabs, so we can look at things from an annual perspective as well. Uh, then we get into some specific medical patient retail sales in specific places. This utilizes the model here that allows you to select any individual uh, town and as well as what other towns that it is uh, taken in on. Um, you know, this portion of the model, uh, once I've worked with the Cannabis Control Board to help them figure out uh, any specific localities uh, that we want to identify, we'll end up running some little bit more complex uh, geographic information to the model to identify the exact towns that are, let's say, within a 5, 10, or 15 mile radius or whatever we want to determine as well as proportions of those pounds which are in that radius. And this will all get adjusted as well. So these numbers particularly, uh, you know, should not be looked at as, as final, uh, given that, you know, additional uh, insights will be uh, delivered uh, as we identify um, which of these localities uh, we need to uh, uh, put some more thought on um, for uh, local fees and, uh, you know, local tax projections. Uh, this includes this both for medical uh, as well as for adult use. Keep scrolling through this. Uh, then we get into supply and demand. So this is, you know, some of the real juice of the model. Um, let me go back to the index for a second. I can just go directly here to supply and demand. Um, you know, how much, what is our supply of cannabis flour? And, and as I mentioned, you know, this changes over time. Every time we hit F9 here, we can see that these numbers change because the frequency of harvest and when people are cropping out is gonna differ uh, based upon kind of the random nature of the amount of time it takes someone from their final license until they are ready to put plants in the ground and then once those plants are ready, when they're ready for harvesting. Uh, then we're looking at demand as well. Early on in the market because, uh, you know, the first uh, cultivators that are gonna get online are not gonna be able to serve the six full medical and adult use demand. We will have undersupply. And then over time, as more of those facilities build out uh, as our first cultivators are getting their second and third harvest and are later on uh, our second and third uh, you know our later on cultivators are, are getting their first harvest this increases as well and over time you can see uh, what percentage of the Vermont medical and adult use market is being capable of served with the inventory that's produced given those different uh, supply numbers and this over time you can see um, you know we start to get into ranges of oversupply now with all of this it's important to Uh, sort of percent, uh, you know, what we're projecting, do we want to target, it's going to be left up to the, you know, board and regulators to determine. Uh, but this probably, you know, gives us some thought. Uh, we could, for instance, change this. So let's say if we're going to do uh, 300,000 uh, square feet, and let's, you know, see what happens if we change all of that. Now, obviously, uh, this changes the whole market. Uh, now, in this case, canopy per square foot of cultivator is uh, 1,500 square feet of flower and canopy. And if we go back in here, we can see that, um, you know, we're much closer to the to just about meeting demand uh, in some places slightly over and some places slightly less. And in this instance, uh, you know, for these certain months, we may not actually have, let's say, enough topicals uh, or enough uh, concentrates or uh, edible products to meet the market. And as such, um, you know, sales would be less than what total demand would uh, would allow for. So we likely want to be somewhere in between. I'll set this, for instance, to uh, uh, 
350,000 square feet just for illustrations purposes. And again, we can see how this model then adjusts once again. Um, uh, then we look at, okay, how much is sold? And this is going to be based upon uh, just what medical is able to sell. And in this model, we're assuming that all supply goes to medical first to satisfy medical demand. And any uh, lack of um, uh, supply that can't be met uh, falls essentially on the adult use side. Um, and then we've got both combined medical and adult use product sales, and then taxes that flow from that as well. And uh, then we break this down on a storefront perspective as well. On the graph side of things, you can see here we've got uh, Vermont Medical and Adult Use Consumers, as I showed you before. Um, consumers in the top 10 uh, market uh, based upon some of these adjustable assumptions. Uh, projected Vermont medical sales by product type, projected Vermont, sorry, Vermont adult use sales by product type. And as you can see here, as we press F9, uh, particularly you know, if we are close to the bounds of not having enough supply, um, here early on when we definitely don't have enough supply, this is going to be, this randomly changes because the amount of cultivation that we have online to meet this demand is going to be different, right? And then in some of the latter months, you can see little periods of time in which this changes because there might not be enough supply to actually meet demand. Um, here again, we can see the product production uh, from new adult use cultivators, so how much cannabis flower, free roll, concentrates, and others. Uh, gram, this, this is grams of flour and then units of other manufactured products. Here then we can see a supply and demand graph and you can, you know, by hitting F9 repeatedly, and the reason I didn't put a controversy, uh, sorry, a confidence interval on this is because all of this model is relying on existing assumptions. So this would be, you know, a confidence, a confidence interval given the assumptions we have, which I don't want people to uh, give essentially false confidence to because our assumptions um, may change over time. So here we can see, you know, we're likely getting uh, somewhere around supply and demand uh, parity uh, in the summer of the 2023, which then, depending on the month, um, cannabis flower supply slightly above what uh, demand is. So, and, and this, of course, we can adjust over time. Uh, uh, maybe, you know, we, we restrict cultivators' uh, cannabis here, or we get a little bit more stringent. Uh, the regulatory agency gets more stringent on uh, people that are uh, have more canopy than they're actually cultivating or selling, um, and you know use of mechanisms to, to bring this closer to parity. But again, we don't want to have undersupply issues where then individual stuff go to the illicit market. This then shows the balance between indoor and outdoor. And you can see uh, there are spikes uh, seasonally in the fall as the outdoor harvest comes online. If, for instance, outdoor cultivation was significantly larger, let's say we were dealing with you know 100,000 square feet. This, which would basically mean that each outdoor cultivator now has 2,000 rather than 800 square feet of flowering canopy. You can see here that the spike uh, would become a lot sharper. And this could uh, throw the balance um, of supply and demand seasonally uh, out of alignment. Um, and I think that there's good information that we can learn from Oregon um, in this instance in uh, balancing between indoor and outdoor cultivation, the risk seasonally of having a large portion of production occur outdoors. Um, and what that does in a market that has a history of really good cannabis cultivation, but also a relatively small amount of demand to absorb that ongoing um, ongoing production uh, that would spike in, uh, in the fall. Um, so yes, yeah, this is a, an abbreviated version of looking at a cannabis model. Um, there's a lot of other goodies in here. Feel free to look through some of these other things. Uh, all, most of the data uh, comes from um, the state itself, uh, looking at population projections at the localized level, and then utilizing national survey on drug use and health data. Uh, I can pull that from, I think where that is. Uh, from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which is a federal government survey data uh, that looks at cannabis use rates at a regional level. Uh, across the country. So this lets us know how many border consumers there are, how many consumers there are at the different regional levels and then county levels in the state of Vermont. And great, does anyone, uh, you know, I'm not sure how I open this questions or just, just end it here, um, but uh, 
model includes quite a number of different assumptions. All of these are pretty hyper-adjustable, and we can utilize to identify how many square feet of cannabis we may need, how much extraction capacity we may need, and as such, the licenses uh, that, that are going to, to start what their initial cultivation allocation may be. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I, I see that uh, Yvonne has a question. I just, um, just to try to translate this into kind of what our, our uh, goal is here. Um, obviously, this is a quite powerful tool that we put together where you can kind of play around with it and see what total capacity is needed, how different, um, you know, outdoor cultivation will, will uh, impact it. Um, what I think uh, our goal as a subcommittee here is to take this information, uh, at least for the first part of the subcommittee, is to take this information and try to make a best uh, estimate on uh, what licenses are needed, how to structure those licenses uh, in order so that we can try to calculate what license fees are needed. We have a couple of uh, directives from the legislature in the, in the, um, in the statute, the first being um, that they would like, if possible, for the fees to cover the full operations of the board. Um, that's going to be uh, a little bit difficult, but we would like to at least estimate what what those fees would need to be in order to cover those costs. Um, the second, they've also asked for um, uh, to keep like to try to incorporate small cultivators and social equity licenses uh, and to keep those fees low, which which adds to some degree of difficulty. So um, we'll talk all about this a little bit more on Monday, but just wanted to start by presenting the model so that you could play around with it uh, today and over the weekend, we can have a, a more informed discussion on Monday about where where, where you'd like to see this go um, and how you'd like to shut this, shape this market. And um, we can talk about how, you know, it's worked in other states or what we're thinking um, and how we fit it with what the legislature's asking. But, um, so hope that makes sense. Uh, Vaughn, do you wanna ask your, uh, your question? Sure, uh, thanks Dan. And you're actually already getting it at the at least right now, the, the one question I really want to ask Andrew. Um, Andrew, thank you. That was a great walkthrough. Um, every model has assumptions, and some assumptions matter more than others um, in any given model. And clearly, so much in the model we just went through is driven by the assumptions around square feet of canopy growth. And so, really, uh, the, the larger question I have is how do we uh, almost model out that assumption to get to a reality check of what do we actually expect in terms of demand? Not demand of, of consumers purchasing, but demand of potential licensees. Right? We've had mm. listing sessions with tons of people who are potential growers, and and how do we start to level set and, and reality check? Um, you know, it's great for us to say, hey, we want to target 400,000 square feet of indoor canopy growth. But the real question is, uh, what are we actually going to see in the market? For people who want to grow, and and so you know, how do we take that to a, a different level of precision and get a sense of whether uh, we can use that to help level set the rest of this? Yeah, absolutely. So this is going to be a difficult um, thing to do, and I think that there's about there's a few different ways we could look at it. The first is to look at other states and try to identify um, how much demand for uh, to be essentially a cannabis cultivation entrepreneur uh, there was in these different states, um, and which states to use as those assumptions. Obviously, the market in a place like Massachusetts. Uh, the potential in a place like Massachusetts and the regulations in a place like Massachusetts are going to be very different than in a place like Vermont. Uh, and as such, the amount of uh, entrepreneurial demand or the demand to be an entrepreneur for cultivation is going to be different in Massachusetts than it would be in Vermont. In Vermont, uh, you know, I think you're going to be looking at you know a combination of a small, you know, from an entrepreneurial perspective, a small market, a market that is hem heavily emphasizing local. Uh, cultivators and smaller businesses, um, and a market that uh, is many seen as remote, and but also a market that doesn't limit licenses because limiting licenses uh, is, I think, one of those things that actually spurs a different uh, additional entrepreneurial demand, a demand to be an entrepreneur because those licenses then hold a significant amount of intrinsic value that can then be sold afterwards. So one of the states I think might be uh, worthwhile to look at is actually very much across the country in Alaska. Uh, Alaska is a relatively small market without a limit on the number of cultivation licenses that heavily uh, emphasizes and prioritizes uh, local residents. So we could look at a state like that with some population adjustments, also a relatively small state, to try to see, okay, how much demand was there to be a cultivation entrepreneur? 
Uh, similar dynamics, most of the cultivation is going to be indoor. Obviously, it's even colder uh, in Alaska, but uh, surprisingly, uh, the weather in Anchorage in the southern part is not too dissimilar, at least at certain points, uh, than it is in Vermont. Um, and so you, again, have seasonal outdoor. That has a pretty short uh, cultivation season there. So that's one uh, way we could look at how much entrepreneurial demand do we think that there's going to be. Another route would be to structure the application process in such a way that we can try to identify the amount or quantify the amount of interest. Uh, that would basically be we put out uh, intent to apply. So a number of different states, particularly those that have done limited licenses, have done that. So they've got a two-stage application process in which you submit your intent to apply. This may just require you putting forward your team, maybe putting forward uh, a local area or pop up a property that you intend yeah, no, to uh, cultivate in, um, and maybe a small amount of initial fees. This then would allow the uh, regulatory agency to try to identify what that initial uh, interest looks like, and then based upon uh, projections for how much supply is needed to, to meet and exceed demand, uh, to proportion those initial cultivators at their starting um, cultivation output, uh, or, or flat per square feet. So I, I hope that helps to answer the question. Thanks, Andrew, and, and um, you, you can elaborate that. I, I just wanted to make sure we, we had some time uh, for anyone in the room. There, Chairman Pepper, uh, who might have a, a question for public comment. Yeah, I think uh, I just went around and talked to everyone. I think we have one public comment, which could probably um, give us uh, just a few minutes for that. Um, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Let me sit here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hello everybody, uh, Jeffrey Pizzatello from the Vermont uh, Growers Association. We are a member also of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition. Um, thank you for your time, it's been very informative, I'll be brief. Uh, I would like for uh, you guys to consider um, if we're making assumptions about canopy size uh, to build around this model and perform analyses, uh, we would like as a coalition for you guys to consider uh, production caps at market rollout. Uh, keep in mind uh, we already have uh, an in-state actor that is flaunting a nearly 100,000 square foot indoor facility, and that would uh, have an impact uh, on uh, a lot of these projections and analyses that we're making. Um, so uh, I'll be brief, urging production caps for the first couple years, keeping in mind that things can change. Maybe we make adjustments after that, but it's important to transition our legacy growers uh, as much as possible through unlimited enrolling licenses and perhaps not regulating market access, but market production. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. No. I, I, I do want to add that this model on the supply side does not include the existing quantity of supply produced by the medical cannabis cultivator. Um, as I, I was able to obtain some of that data, but not enough in a way that would allow me to anonymize it. Um, so that it's not potentially identifiable to a state of business. So um, that is one of those things that you know, if we're able to get that data from the state itself with all of the operators that exist, uh, would be a significant benefit to add uh, to understanding what our total, both medical and adult use output supply is in the state of Vermont. Thanks, Andrew. Chairman Pepper, any other public comments? Uh, I, don't think, I don't think we have any other takers for public comment. Okay. Thank you. Dan, did you have some wrap up as we're just about out of time and need to start our next Yeah, I can, I can wrap up for, yeah, I can wrap up uh, in a couple minutes. I, it, uh, I started to wrap up uh, um, just a moment ago, but we wanted to kind of frame it this way because we thought this model was important to, to get to all the subcommittee members so they could look at it, see, see the assumptions that we're making or which assumptions you think should be adjusted. Um, before we started opening it up to like a, a full conversation in a collaborative process. So that's probably what we're gonna, that's what we intend to start on um, on Monday. Um, so there'll be an agenda set out, but there'll be time to um, ask any follow-up questions of Andrew about the model or about anything else that we talked about and then start a discussion of how um, the subcommittee members kind of envision the market going forward. Again, um, for at least for these first couple weeks, uh, we are uh, focused and, and somewhat constrained by the uh, need to get the statutory uh, statutorily required report on feedback to the legislature based on kind of the um, 
parameters that are set in that legislation. Um, so that that's lower fees for social equity licenses, a, a, a drive to have as many small cultivators uh, included as possible, um, and a, a goal of trying to have the fees cover um, uh, cover operations. So. Um, it, you know, one of the alternatives here might be to um, pre present multiple recommendations where, where one would be high fees that cover operational costs, but, uh, you know, because of other problems aren't actually uh, an ideal policy solution. And then we can try to come up with, you know, the recommendations that seem to be more in line with what Vermont wants and, and how to uh, have a robust market that includes um, small growers and social equity growers. So. Um, that, that's the discussion that will kick off on Monday. Uh, I hope you uh, um, all had enough, uh, had a, got enough from that model and uh, understood uh, what was going on, because I know Andrew did a great job presenting it, and there's a lot of information in there, so we tried to present it as quickly as possible. Uh, but hopefully you got the, got the gist. Um, so that's all. Um, I see there is one, one more question from uh, Tim Wessel, um, but then, then I think we're ready to, um, I'm ready to wrap up. Tim? Hi, yes, thank you. I'm just here to remind you that I think under fees, you are supposed to be discussing local fees as well um, as part of your charge from the legislature. Right, that was, um, that will probably be, uh, I think the first Monday meeting will kind of be general uh, state level fees, you know, at, but at some point, because we don't have a long runway here, uh, we'll probably start talking about local fees and, and trying to project local fees, which adds so many other levels of, uh, of so many other variables and other levels of difficulty uh, probably starting a week from today. Um, if, if it all goes to plan, maybe uh, if not, a, it will be the following Monday, but um, we will we will discuss it. And, Thank and you. we'll naturally be discussing that in two minutes, the next subcommittee meeting under, under compliance. Uh, but I wanted to thank Andrew, Dan, and everyone for participating in the meeting. Uh, make a motion to adjourn if I have a second and a third we can adjourn and we will uh another subcommittee meeting at i think it's two o'clock on monday if nelly sends out the invite so a move to adjourn this meeting for market structure licensing fees and taxes we have a second here <laughs> stephanie great thank you stephanie you're welcome you money everyone thank, thank you, you. Tom. <laughs>